I, uh, I wrote this message weeks ago. And uh, it's one of those messages where at the time I didn't think anything of it. But now I just kind of uh, wish I had a different message that I could do instead. You know, it's, it's, it's hard not to be in control. I think everybody can agree on that. We don't really like, as people, not being in control. I mean, pick an area, uh, you know, with our family, with politics, with the church, with whatever. We like to be in control of the situation. Um, really, we're obsessed with being in control. And uh, we're so obsessed with being in control that we even want to try and fix everyone else. You know, it, it's, not, it's not good enough for us to try and just be in control of our life. We want to be in control of what everybody else is too. And, um, you know, when, it, when it's our kids, it's even worse. And, you know, we, we want our kids to do everything right and perfect, and we want them to act how we want them to act. But then they don't. And it's just, it's hard to deal with that. And obviously, this whole lesson, I'm going to use the example of physical kids, but I want you to think more broadly about uh, spiritual kids and spiritual family. Because we, we as a body of Christ, we're all like one family. And when a member leaves the, part, uh, leaves the body, it has an effect on the whole body. So I, I, I want you to not just think about your kids, but also think about the church as a whole. Um, you know, God is our Father, and He really does know what's best. Amen. You know, we as fathers try to do what's best for our kids. That's, if I could give a dictionary definition of what a father is, it's someone who sacrificially gives of himself for the sake of the next generation, for the sake of their upcoming children. Um, it's like a picture where a father is taking out squares of himself and giving it to his son. That's, the, that's what I think of when I think of what a father is. And since I had kids, I see this even more so. And I see it in a lot of the great fathers, you know, that throughout history um, that have, you know, really developed their kids. And you can tell when fathers haven't developed their kids and haven't given them the time because they lack that sense of identity. They lack that sense of character. Um, out, of, out of the children, or I should say out of the young men who end up in prison, a, a startling an, an amount of them did not have an active father figure in their life. And uh, I think that that really goes to say a lot. And you know, it bothers him, it bothers God when people don't live his way. He tells us how to live, he tells us, you know, even the benefits that we'll experience by living his way. And then we still go off and do our own thing. And uh, now that I'm a father, I understand a little bit more how frustrating that must be. <laughs> uh, for God, being the only perfect one out there, <laughs> to have to put up with our nonsense. Um, but anyways, Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32 is about, uh, it's called the prodigal son. Um, so I'll, we'll start there. And he said, a young man had two sons. The younger uh, of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the state that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began, and began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into his field to, to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. 
and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to celebrate. Excuse me. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat, so I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with, with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. So there's a few things that a lot of people point out. There's the issue that the other brother said, this son of yours, not my brother. And then the father says, your brother. Okay, and then there's obviously the thing that a lot of, peop a lot of people talk about with the honor and shame culture that they lived in back then. For a father to ask for an inheritance was basically like wishing his father to die. Um, in a culture that revolved around the dominant you know, father head of the household, um, for him to act in such a dishonorable way would have reflected poorly on the father, and it would have obviously reflected poorly on himself. That much hasn't changed. And uh, you know, and then there's obviously that. There's, there's other things that we kind of miss in the culture. The father, for the father to run to the son was very disgraceful, that kind of stuff. Um, they were expected to have a dignified position and running was not really in that dignity. So there's a lot of stuff like that that people talk about, but that's not really what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about lessons can, that can be learned in the case of rebellion. Have, have any of you guys ever rebelled against God? Have you ever done something real stupid and then maybe even done it for a few years? Yeah, okay. So remember that next time you see someone that does something real stupid. Um, there's three main lessons I want to address that we can learn um, about rebellion. Specifically when dealing with rebellious children. First off, if you look in verse 20, it says this. So he got up and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him. So the first thing is the father was waiting for them. Oh, sorry there. Yeah, the father was waiting for them. He... If the father had seen him when he was, a, he was a far way off, that would mean he was looking for him to come back. The first thing we do when we feel betrayed, especially when someone in the church leaves, is we just kind of say good riddance, and that's the end of that. But that's not what we see this father doing. Instead, he didn't get better. He waited for them. He waited for him to come back. And... Uh, I think that that's the first thing we can learn from this from this story, is not to give up on people. You know, people living in sin act sinfully. It's what they do. They are slaves to sin. It's funny. Before I got serious about God, I always thought that Christians were the ones who were like robots. They didn't have any free will. They just kind of did what they were programmed to do. The longer I'm, I serve God, the more I realize everything that you do when you don't serve God is serving the flesh. You follow the same patterns. You go from thing to thing. You feel empty, so you do something to make yourself feel better, so you do it over again. You might change the way you do it. You might go to drugs or sex or alcohol or whatever, but eventually that thing doesn't give you any more hope, so you go to the next thing. Or you get stuck in the same old process of doing the same things over and over again. Either way, you're bound to that same lifestyle. There is no real change that happens. Now that I'm in Christ, I have a freedom that I didn't even know existed before I was in Christ. It's, I have a free will. Now I can choose whether to obey God or to not obey God. Before, it was an automatic, I chose whatever was dishonorable to God because I was a slave to sin. Well now, in Christ, I'm a slave to righteousness. Amen. Things have changed, and I can see clearly, I can see how things can so easily change how I think about stuff. Like, take for instance a, a common a common thing that most of America's men do. Look at pornography. 
People don't really think about it, but pornography is one of the biggest causes for a lot of different things, including abuse, child molestation. It's the result of the lifestyle. But when you're not looking at porn, you don't even realize how much it affected you. See the difference there? And that's kind of what I'm talking about. So don't get bitter, wait for them. The second thing that I think that we can learn, of the three lessons that we can learn um, about rebellious children is in verses 17 through 18. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Which brings us to the very second, very important lesson. Very important lesson. You can't force them. You can't force them to do what's right, and you can't force them to stop being stupid and to make the right decisions. You can't force them. The father didn't go after his son and force him to do the right thing. He let him laugh, leave. That was his choice. And he waited for him, hoping that he would come back. That's all you can do. What we do is, when somebody does something that we don't like, we get in this childlike fantasy of believing that we can somehow control them. And so we try everything possible to make their decisions for them. If I can just say the right thing, if I can just do the right thing, no. Because, listen to me on this, their bad decision is not your fault. If a husband cheats on a wife, on his wife, whose fault is it? The husband. If a child rebels against their, fa their father and mother, whose fault is it? The child's. It's not your fault. When someone does something, it's their fault. They made the decision. That's one of the first things you deal with when done with people who get out of prison and out of drugs, is they have this mindset that, first off, it's always their parents' fault. Everything is their parents' fault. And, I mean, everything. Y you talk to them, and they're in this, they're in this perpetual state of being 16. They're, they're mad at mommy and daddy, they haven't grown or matured past it. They've stayed at the exact same state. And here they are at 30, 40, 50, 60. Yes, I'm serious, 60 years old. And they don't know that it's not their parents' fault. It's their fault. They made the decision. See, and what we do is we, we guilt trip ourselves. Oh, yes, it's my fault. Yes, I have somehow wronged you. No. Maybe you aren't the perfect parent. Maybe you aren't the perfect brother or sister. Maybe you aren't the perfect son or daughter. Everybody's decision is their fault, not yours. And carrying around the burden that everybody else's fault and decision is your fault will never end in you being a successful minister for Christ because you're going to be carrying guilt that God did not give to you to carry. And I think that's very important to remember. So he came to his senses. You can't force them to do what's right. What we try and do is we try and pray for God to take away their free will. God, force them to do what's right. If you would just, God doesn't do that. He lets them have their free will. He lets them have their choice. That's not always what we want, but it's still God's way. God knew that Adam and Eve were going to mess up in the garden. He still gave them the opportunity to do it because God didn't create robots. He gave people the choice. And no choice can exist in a vacuum. If there was never an opportunity to sin, it couldn't really be said that God ever gave free will. But God did give free will because he gave the opportunity to sin. And they chose to sin. Just because he knew that they were going to sin doesn't mean that it was God's fault that they sinned. See the difference? We get a little bit confused somewhere between here and there because we, we allow our emotions to override God's truth. See what I mean? For instance, well, before I got saved, I... Was this or that or the other thing? Well, you're saved now, so you're no longer that. It's gone. It's in the past. Move on. Because God has. And I think if the creator of heaven and earth has moved on, maybe you should do. So you can't pray for God to take away the free will. The third of the three that I think is very, very important is found in verse 16. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating. And no one was giving anything to him, which is the hardest thing to do, especially when somebody leaves the church. But once again, the, all, these, all of these things apply to the family. You can't go to them. You can't continue to provide for them. Because check this out, they won't learn. 
if you read the story, what does he say in verse 12? The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And that was it. He didn't keep giving the son a salary. He didn't keep going to the son and saying, look, why don't, why don't I just give you a few dollars? And No. Because that's the process of growth. We have to hurt for there to be transformation. Before I had panic attacks and anxiety, I did nothing for God's kingdom. Conflict, now I'm used by God. God uses the conflict to turn us into someone of character. And if we try and remove the conflict from someone, we will remove the opportunity for them to grow. And I am also talking about physical children on this one. When your kids are faced with a hard decision, you have to let them grow from it. If you try and remove the hard situation, they will repeat the same thing over and over again. And here's the thing, God's not gonna give up. God's going to work character on them, regardless of whether you're in his way or not. So eventually, he will move you out of his way. Or you can go willingly and God can actually get something done. It's really up to you, but God's not going to just back off. Because check this out, no matter how much you love someone, God loves them more. And God is relentless with his love. He follows after you and he crushes you with his love. And right when you think, maybe I can hide from God, he finds you there too. You think, maybe if I go to the depths of the earth, maybe he won't find me there, but even our darkness is a light to him. Even our darkness is, is light to him, is what Psalm says. He finds us and he chases us down with that relentless love because we are his children. So when you make these decisions, don't make them thinking this is my, this is someone who I raised up in the faith. I can't believe this person left the church. I put so much time and effort into them. They were God's children, not yours. My child rebelled against God. He rebelled against me. I don't even, talk, I don't even see my son or my daughter anymore. It's not yours, it's God's. God allows us temporary time to train and to raise up. And then our time is up. But God continues the work. If I die, I know, I know God will still continue the work in my son. I know. And the work that I'm doing, I know that God will send someone else to take care of it. I don't have to worry about that thing because it's not all about me. There's so much insecurity you can get over when you're in Christ. So much insecurity. So the, so the three lessons. Wait for them to turn. Don't get bitter. You can't force them. You can't force a decision. You can't force their hand. And the last one, you can't go to them. You can't continue to provide for them. It's time to cut the cord. I know that's hard to do. We always, always want to be there to coddle our children, but our children need to grow up. And so do, so do we. We need to grow up too. And this idea that we somehow need someone to constantly be providing for us is just faulty. So there's just a few more things. Be loving and sensitive to the Holy Spirit and sympathetic. Don't ever get hardened in your heart. God desires for us to be his hands and feet, but you really can't be his hands and feet if you aren't loving, if you're not following the Holy Spirit, and if you're not sympathetic. If you don't really care about people, you know what I mean? See, but the problem is that a lot of times people think that if I love someone, I have to bail them out. Like, for instance, we see a lot of homeless person, people who say this to us all the time. You aren't really a Christian because you aren't giving me money. No, I will help you get a job. I will, I will help you get, get your finances in order. I will help you, you know, learn and grow. But I'm not going to help you make poor life decisions. How much money do you think I have given to homeless people in the last year? Nothing. Guess how much time and and volunteer work and driving around and doing all that stuff I've done for homeless people in the last year. A lot. Why? Because they don't need someone to throw money at them. They need somebody to love them. 
And love often requires something that is very, very unpleasant. It's called hard love. That's where you do something that's for their best interest, even though it's not what they want. Don't enable people. Don't be an enabler. What's an, en what's an enabler? That's someone who helps someone continue to live the foolish way that they're living. I'm pretty sure everybody knows what I'm talking about. I have seen about seven different people do that, do this with their kids this week alone. So I know that people are doing it. So don't act all high and mighty with me, because I know that people are doing it. We do things to enable people so they can continue to live, fo live foolishly. We, do, we don't just do it with money either, we do it with gossip too. Well, I'm a gossip, and things aren't working well, and I'm in a bunch of conflicts, and so now I'm gonna come to you, and you're going to give me an ear so I can gossip to you some more. You're enabling their gossip. Don't think I'm just talking about finances here. I think it also applies to finances, but there's a bigger picture here I'm talking about. Don't enable someone to live foolishly. I blew all my money this week on alcohol. Now I don't have any money for my rent. Will you help me? No, I will not help you do that. But that's exactly what we have from people in the apartments, from people in the area, that we see this on a weekly basis. And the thing is, we, in our culture, we have something called a drug epidemic. Everybody's doing drugs. <laughs> so what we have to do is we have to really help people get out of drugs. Because here's the thing, people who are in drugs don't want to get out of drugs. They don't like the effects of being in drugs, but they don't want to change their lifestyle. They want everything to magically change without having to change anything that they're doing. If you help them to continue to do that, you are helping them to kill themselves. Think about that. You're helping them to kill themselves. You're helping them to throw their life away. If you truly love and care about them, you will do what's in their best interest. Hate shown to us is actually rebellion to God. When you are dealing with rebellious people, physical or spiritual, it doesn't really matter. And by spiritual, I don't mean dealing with spirits. I mean talking about spiritual children, people who were once in the body who left the body, or physical children or whatever. They will oftentimes be very hateful and mean and rude to us. Well, the thing is, is they're not really being mean and hateful to us. They're being mean and hateful to God. We're caught in the middle. You see what I'm saying? What happens, and this took me a very, very long time, is that God told us to love people. And so when we show hate to somebody, we're actually disobeying God. So that, there's that whole thing there that's happening. And... I think we need to we we need to remember the, these these things. And the last thing I want to say: search your heart for your own rebellion. Because what we like to do is we like to see everything else, everybody else is doing wrong. Wow, look at them, God! You really need to go get a hold of them. Where is the rebellion in your heart? I don't have any rebellion in my heart. You're not looking hard enough. There is a verse that Pastor quotes quite frequently. It's "Let he who stands." Be careful, lest ye fall. Let's, let ye who thinks that he stands. There you go. I said it wrong. But you know what I'm saying. Because Pastor says it all the time anyways. Do you guys kind of get what I'm saying here? So I, I hope that you guys kind of think about, think about all this stuff. Because I, I really can't pound this in enough. When, when you have children who are choosing to live foolishly and then you provide for them, you are helping them to live foolishly. Everybody's clear on that? Yeah. Okay. So there's no confusion? No. Okay. So when somebody comes to the church and says, hey, I need $25 to buy my medication, are you going to give them $25? You're looking at me with that look. I need to see a clear, you will understand what I'm saying, right? <laughs> If they need the money, they will work. Because check this out, do you know what one of the greatest motivators is to not being lazy? Need. If I need food, if I need water, if I need a house, I will work. And then I will be concerned about my money because I have worked so hard for it. So I will stop wasting my money on stupid things. 
you understand how that works? But when we provide for someone who says, no, God, you can't have anything to do with my finances because I'm the master of my own finances. So now what you're saying is, yes, I agree. You, you are the master of your own finances, and I'm going to help you rebel against God with your finances. That's what you do when you provide for people who continuously decide to live foolish. Now, if somebody hits a rough patch, that's different. And I fully believe in helping the needy. Okay, there's a lot of orphans. There's a lot of kids in foster care. There's a lot. There are kids everywhere. And I'll tell you something. There's a lot of kids in this community who don't have parents. They are left on their own, wandering from house to house. And they need strong, strong mother and father figures in their lives. You don't have to look real hard. We've got about half of the ones in our, in our Wednesday night services. And they need someone who just cares. You don't have to look real hard. But if you waste all your time and your money on people who are 40 and 50 and should have learned responsibility at this point, you will never be able to be used by God to reach those who actually are in need. Let me give you one last kind of example. I shoot myself in the foot and I say, hey, you need to take care of that. Okay, well, I wouldn't have shot yourself in the foot, but okay, give me the gun and I'll help. So I take the gun and I shoot myself again in the foot. How, how are you going to help that? Because they have decided how they want to live. You understand what I'm saying? There, 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 there's a, and I, I know that you guys say that you understand what I'm saying, but... On a weekly basis, we have quite a lot of people come to the church asking, asking for money when they could have taken care of it themselves. They have decided to throw their money away on alcohol, on drugs, and all kinds of stuff. And then they say, oh, I need money to pay for my kids' birthday presents. Are you joking right now? <laughs> Are you serious? I really, really, really want to make sure that we understand this because check this out. If we're not all working together on this, we will never see a change in our community. Do you understand that? If we don't work together and see eye to eye on this, we will never see a change in our community. Drugs will continue to rise, and yes, drugs are a problem. It is ruining our community, and it's been here for too long, and we need to do something about it. And I'm not talking about yell at people who are doing drugs. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about helping them to get out of drugs. I'm talking about being there for the kids who don't have parents. I'm talking about sacrificing your time and your resources for the sake of this community because that's the only way we're gonna be able to get Toro Rosa out of the rut that it's in. There's a bunch of people who see a problem, but they don't wanna do anything about it. Oh, I don't, have a, I don't have a drug problem, I just drink nonstop. I was arguing with a woman a couple days ago who was trying to convince me that Xanax wasn't a drug. Well, I see their effects that it's doing in your life and it really looks like a drug to me. It alters your, the way you're thinking, isn't that a drug? See, we need to help people because pointing fingers and yelling at them isn't working. It's not working. And ignoring the problem isn't working because it's not going away, it's getting worse. The world needs the hands and feet of Christ. That's what it needs. So we're gonna go ahead and close there. Um, if I could have uh, Pastor Chuck close us in prayer and then Joe, if you would mind when he's 